Meeting of the House Housing Finance and Policy Committee to order and note that a quorum is present. Uh, Representative Johnson, have you had a chance to review the minutes? I just uh, quickly breeze <coughs> through them and they look okay. Thank you, Representative Johnson. Uh, all those in favor of approving the minutes, say aye. 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 All right. Um, the minutes are passed. Um, and then, let's see here. Oh, we actually, one more bit of business to approve the minutes from the previous hearing. Representative Igbaje, would you make that motion? Yes, I move that. Um, all those in favor of approving minutes of the previous meeting, say aye. Aye. That is approved as well. Um, welcome Representative Her to the stand. It's, it's Representative Her Day in housing. Uh, <laughs> we have several of her bills up. Um, and we do have with a full slate, I'm gonna ask our testifiers to keep their testimony to three minutes or less. And we'll try to budget about 20 to 25 minutes per bill here uh, today and uh, get, get moving. And the first bill we're gonna hear is House File 445. And I will move that House File 445 be re-referred to the House Judiciary, Finance, and Civil Law Committee and introduce Representative Her to the committee to present her bill. Thank you, Chair Howard and, and, and committee members. Um, it's a little bit odd to be sitting on this side of the table in this committee. So it was such an honor to serve in housing uh, for the four years uh, that I've actually um, served on the, on the committee and it's a little bit bittersweet for me to be here um, and not as a member, but um, the bills that I have today I've carried for the last four years. And uh, those who have served with me, you are very well aware of my story and I'd like to ground us in that story before I present my first bill today. I came to this country as a refugee by the grace of God and uh, a little bit of privilege being connected to the USCIA. My uh, parents and I uh, were able to uh, come to the United States and my father was able to secure a well-paying job uh, at a manufacturing company called Snap-on Tools. He and my mother were able to purchase their first home within the first year of us being uh, in this country. I didn't understand the significance of that at the time, but uh, I've come to really comprehend the impact of having that home. Um, having stable and affordable housing meant that my five siblings and I had a place to study, my parents had an address to secure employment, and we were able to build wealth. There were periods of my life where we relied on public assistance, food shelves, and the generosity of our church for clothing and other needs, but in those times we were never without a home. Because of stable housing, my siblings and I went on to earn graduate degrees and we were able to find gainful employment, uh, which allowed my family to break the cycle of poverty in just one generation. At the intersection of our disparities in health, education, income, and wealth is housing. I truly believe that my life experience validates that. Whether you own a home or you rent, people have to have protection in their home. That requires updating our landlord and tenant laws. The slate of bills before the committee today are bills that attempt to do just that. In preparation for the hearing today, uh, I thought I, I would do a little bit of research on the landscape of renting in Minnesota. And what I found uh, stated over and over again is that Minnesota is a landlord friendly state. This is because Minnesota's uh, tenant landlord laws have not received serious revision in decades. Today is not about assigning uh, labels of good or bad to tenants or landlords, but understanding that, that landlords write leases and that the balance of power tilts heavily towards the landlord. The law, in addition to outlining the parameters for tenants and landlord must also include specific rights and protections for tenants that help level the playing field. And Chair Howard, I don't know if I remember hearing, but did, did, did the bills get moved, did this bill get moved already? Did you move the bill for me? Or? Yes, Representative. Okay, I just wanna make sure, thank you, Chair Howard. So with that, the first bill before us is House File 445. This is a bill prohibiting discrimination based on source of income. This bill seeks to make additions to the Minnesota Human Rights Act to ban source of income discrimination in relation to housing. It's, uh, it's specifies that, the, uh, that potential tenants or homeowners cannot be discriminated against based on the fact that they receive public assistance. And public assistance is defined as federal, state, or local assistance, including but not limited to rental assistance, <coughs> rent supplements, and housing subsidy programs. The last figure that I could find is that nearly 15% of Minnesotans actually qualify for some type of public assistance. That doesn't mean that 15% of our population actually is a public assistant, but they qualify, they may not even know it. So allowing for this type of discrimination uh, to persist potentially hurts a large segment of our uh, Minnesotans. Banning source of income discrimination is already law in 17 states and over 90 localities nationwide. It is time for Minnesota to follow suit. So uh, Mr. Chair, uh, I have testifiers here to speak to this bill, and so if you are okay with that this time, I'll yield my time to our testifiers. Thank you. Up first we have Ms. Kaplan, uh, Margaret Kaplan with the Housing Justice Center. Uh, please state your name and for the record, and we're glad you're here. 
Uh, thank you, Chair Howard and members of the committee. My name is Margaret Kaplan, and I am the president of the Housing Justice Center. Um, Housing Justice Center is a nonprofit, public interest, advocacy, and legal organization whose primary mission is to preserve and expand affordable housing for low-income individuals and families in the state of Minnesota <coughs> and to protect the rights of people who need affordable places to call home. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about source of income discrimination, put it in some national context, and then talk about why it's so important here in Minnesota to be addressing this critical issue. So right now, uh, Minnesota is in the position of being a bit of an outlier when it comes to source of income protections. Right now, according to PRAC, over 57% of households in the country with housing choice vouchers lives in, live in states, counties, or local jurisdictions with source of income anti-discrimination laws. That includes 17 states, 21 counties, and 81 cities. Now, there are a wide variety of voucher programs that need to be protected through this legislation. We talk a lot about the Section 8 Housing Choice Voucher Program, which is one of the largest sources of deeply affordable housing opportunities in the country. Um, but there are other programs as well, like VASH vouchers that serve veterans or uh, Bridges vouchers that serve people with disabilities. And those are only some examples of the types of vouchers that people are trying to use. This legislation doesn't change the ability of a landlord to set their rents or change their screening criteria. Uh, they simply cannot use who is paying the rent as the government as a basis for rejecting potential tenants. And there are a number of reasons why this matters deeply. First of all, source of income protections increase shopping success rates and voucher utilization rates. After years of being on waiting lists, that people have to be on a lottery to get one, um, it is a tragedy that people have a hard time finding places to use their vouchers. They have a limited amount of time to shop with their voucher, and sometimes they receive their golden ticket only to have to turn it back. Shopping success rates in Minnesota are typically ranging, depending on where you are, between 40 and 60 percent. So that means you have turn back rates that are very substantial. And this is true both in the metropolitan area as well as in greater Minnesota. Source of income protections also increase housing choices. Vouchers enable black, indigenous, and people of color renters, people with disabilities, and families with children to find places to live in the community of their choice. It increases housing mobility and allows people to make choicing, choices about what's best for their individual needs, including places near great schools, necessary services, transportation routes, and jobs. Source of income protections also prevent displacement of longtime renters when properties are sold. For example, we recently represented someone who after 12 years of living in the same apartment, always being a model tenant, was displaced from his home when the property was acquired by someone who refused to accept his voucher. This was also the experience of a lot of the folks who were living at the crossroads of Penn, for example. When properties are purchased, longtime renters are displaced. Um, and so with that as background, um, we have some recorded testimony from Heidi Storm. I think we've worked out the... the audio okay. Um, well, I have her testimony written and I'm willing to read it if that... Uh, Perhaps we could have that uh, emailed to, to members of the committee. Okay. Excellent. And then the next testifier we have is Liana Stefaniak, Vice Chair of the Minnesota Multi-Housing Association. Ms. Stefaniak, welcome to the committee. Uh, good afternoon, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you this afternoon. Um, as stated, my name is Leanna Stefaniak and I am the board, first vice chair for the Minnesota Multi-Housing Association. I'm here today to offer my testimony for House File 445. Um, I respectfully oppose the proposals um, written in House File 445 for several reasons, um, namely because it does mandate a property owner or manager's participation 
and the federal government's Section 8 Housing Choice Voucher Program. Additionally, House File 445 makes it a discriminatory practice for a landlord to not participate in the program. This proposal <coughs> takes away a provider's option to participate in this program and forces the provider to enter into a contract with the federal government administered by local housing authorities. Removing the housing provider's option to opt in also removes the house, local housing authority's incentive to improve programs or response to concerns. If the participation is mandatory, there is no need to fix problems within the program. The Section 8 program requires housing providers to execute the housing assistant payment contract, otherwise known as the HAP contract. This is a 12-page document which provides stipulations that go beyond a regular lease agreement. And when in conflict, it's the terms of the HAP contract that prevail. It's a unilateral government contract that fundamentally alters the residential lease agreement entered into between the landlord and the resident. Under the HAP contract, the housing authority can reduce or completely ignore payments to the housing provider, and the housing provider has little to no recourse. The housing authority has no liability for resident behavior. If there's damage to the unit, the housing authority is not financially responsible. There is no guarantee of a security deposit. The housing authority may terminate the HAP contract if available program funding is not sufficient to continue to provide assistance, which is something to deeply consider when a federal government shutdown could reduce these payments, cut the payments completely, and there's no more funding to the housing provider and there's no recourse to them. The tenant is not responsible for funds that are owed under the HAP contract by the federal government meaning that if there's a failure for the housing provider to continue, or excuse me, the housing authority to continue to provide the assistance, it is not a violation of the lease and the property owner is no longer able to reclaim the unit under a termination of um, tenancy. Finally, any proposed rent increases are done at the discretion and approval of the local housing authority. These are just a few examples of some of the problematic terms that are found within the HAP contract. Forced participation in a government program where there is little to no recourse for the housing provider is not a good direction for the state of Minnesota. The legislature could instead consider a light touch option to gain housing provider participation within the Section 8 program. I would recommend to the chair and members of this committee, uh, committee excuse me, to instead consider a funding a part participation incentive to expand local participation for the Section 8 program in the state of Minnesota. Um, with that, I thank you, Mr. Chair and members, um, for hearing my testimony today. Thank you for your testimony. Is there any members of the public that would wish to testify in this bill? If not, we can go to member questions. Are there member questions? Uh, Representative Johnson. <coughs> or I can go to, is there other members I can finish with you, Representative Johnson, if, any other members? Or is it Norris? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I just wanted to thank uh, Representative Herr for bringing this bill forward. I had a constituent in my office yesterday who uh, specifically pointed to this bill and talked about some of the challenges that she and other members of her community have faced in terms of uh, using uh, Section 8 housing vouchers uh, to get housing, and so she uh, strongly encouraged me to support this legislation given the kind of on-the-ground impact that she and, and so many of her friends and family have felt. Representative Nash. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and to the author, Mr. Chair. Thank you, um, Representative Her. I guess my question would be: uh, It seems like a very wide-sweeping bill that would take away the ability for a property owner to use their property in a way that they see fit. And, and uh, you've been in committee with me enough times to know that I'm a big property rights person, and this seems a very heavy-handed, very prescriptive that you will do this. Um, and that just doesn't strike me as very Minnesotan. And I certainly understand that we need, we need to solve uh, housing problems and that, and that we need to provide a, a way for people to, to find their home. But I also know a lot of the people who are housing providers. And I get a little rankled when someone is told what to do with their property in such a way. And I just, I, I, I'm not sure that that's your, 
can't question your intent here in the legislature, but I, I'm just concerned by how heavy handed and prescriptive this is because I know that many of the housing providers want to do their level best to provide a good, safe, warm home for people through uh, perhaps apartment living or, or homes or whatever. Uh, but this is very wide sweeping and very prescriptive. And Ms. Stefaniak made the case, I think, quite well, um, that you're, you're giving, you're taking away someone's opportunity to say no. And that just seems very un-Minnesotan. Representative, for a, a comment? Uh, thank you, Chair Howard, and uh, thank you, Representative Nash, for that question. So I think that if you were going to base the response on Ms. Uh, Stefani's uh, uh, statement, um, I would have to correct a couple of her statements. One is that this doesn't actually mandate property owners to participate in this pro program. Property owners are still allowed to screen somebody as they normally would looking at their uh, their credit score, looking at you know their rent payments, their past payments, like they can use all their same criteria. And if somebody else is a better tenant, they can take that tenant. No, nothing in this program forces a landlord to participate in this. Um, also, that the federal government, the issues around like the government not being able to pay or the increases, those things are actually um, <laughs> uh, really uh, statements made not based on anything that is concrete. Uh, rent increases, so a landlord can charge market rate for their rent. The program actually pays for the difference between what somebody can pay versus what the market uh, what the market says that rent, that rent should be, and so actually they're just getting guaranteed income. I would say that that's actually very Minnesotan. This is actually very not heavy-handed. It's giving a lot of leeway to people to make those choices, and um, it doesn't actually take uh, rights away from property owners. Um, and what I would say is that we probably thought that it was wide-sweeping when we said that you couldn't discriminate against people's race or their religion, and that was considered wide-sweeping then. And yet now we come to understand that is extremely something that we all should be following. And so I would say that this is just in line with that as well so that we don't discriminate against people from lower incomes. All up, Representative Nash. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, um, Representative, uh, you know, we see oftentimes the news that, that the, the federal government passes a continuing resolution. Um, and here in the state, I think before you joined us, we did have a little, little shutdown. Um, I, I think that by broadening this and, and by making it a little more prescriptive or a lot more prescriptive that you also put at risk many of the people who uh, are the housing providers and you uh, and you are really looking at potentially upsetting uh, the, the flow of payments into their organizations, uh, much like we saw with the Minnesota Rent Helps debacle that, uh, that many of them are still owed money and uh, we can see that interruptions like that are devastating towards them. Uh, many of them are still trying to recover from that. And, um, I, I'm just concerned. I think, again, um, I have spoken to a lot of the folks who are housing providers. They have grave concerns with this, um, as you have heard. And for me, I, 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 as you know, I'm a huge housing and home proponent. This doesn't seem like the answer, and I can't support this. Representative Johnson. Chair Howard, Representative Perr. I as well have some issues with this bill. I think it, uh, it's actually going to go backwards in, how th in uh, keeping our rental stock available. I've talked to uh, some people, in fact, in today, that uh, said there's a lot of Section 8 housing available right now. It's not it's with open market. But the concern I have with uh, this pr proposal is that it takes away the owner's rights. The right to have a little say in what, in who they uh, provide housing for. One, one thing that I've concerned about is being forced to do Section 8 housing. Yes, we have had state shutdowns. As far as I know, we've, I don't think we've had a federal shutdown, but it's been right to the wire within hours of the state of the federal government shutting down. But our state has shut down a couple times. The federal government doesn't send out the money the state does. And if the federal government doesn't provide enough funding, for the program, 
the state can actually reduce the, con the amount in the contract to be paid. If they wanted to, they could pay 10 cents on the dollar. And at that rate, repairs are neglected. Capital outlay to repair the roofs, because they gotta be, every 30 years, they're replacing the roof on the buildings. Every so often, they have to replace the re washer, or if there's washers and dryers, they have to replace them. The refrigerators, the air conditioners, the ovens, those do need to be replaced, the carpets. It's gonna change the way it's actually, I, my guess, it's gonna increase rental costs to the point where most people aren't gonna be able to afford renting. Like I say, I do have a lot of concerns with this. And I'm just wondering if you could tell me if for some reason the, fund, the state funds that are set aside for the uh, contracts through Section 8 run short and they have to pay 50 cents on the dollar, how is the housing provider going to make up those funds other than uh, raise the rent on the other individuals that live there not on the program? Representative Herr. Mr. Chair uh, and um, Representative Johnson, um, thank you for the question. So I want to just first um, clarify a couple of things. Um, it, what you're stating about the government not paying or paying 50 cents, uh, that's just not a thing. Uh, I also want to be very clear that Section 8 housing, there's not an abundance of it out there. There isn't. There's actually a shortage of Section 8 housing, a public, uh, for, uh, housing that will take public assistance. And so there are people who are on wait lists for years and years and years. And so I just want to make sure that we understand the landscape of what we're looking at, that what you're stating just isn't true. Uh, the other thing that I do want to say is that we keep talking about government shutdown. And you all, my colleagues across the aisle, we are friends when it comes to business. I spent 15 years in the private sector. We all know that the American government is the only one who's debt and the only one who's government but that we rely on because it is a stable government. So even when the government does shut down, the fact that the American federal government and the state of Minnesota will make good on what it is they owe, that is the case, which is why foreign governments invest in America. So there's all of these statements made about being worried about not getting paid. It's just not a reality. Um, and so I do want to also just uh, turn it over to my testifier who could speak to a couple of the points here and that property owners actually um, are not having any rights taken away. Remember that when you rent your business, your house out, you're running a business. And right now we already have laws that regulate how businesses and their properties are used, which means this is the exact same thing. It is no different. And so uh, I will turn it over to my testifier here can speak to some of that as well. Yeah. Ms. Kaplan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to clarify is just kind of the flow of resources for the Section 8 uh, voucher program. Um, it is not a state program and the funding does not flow through the state of Minnesota. There are actually agreements that are made directly between PHAs, public housing authorities, and HRAs, housing and redevelopment authorities, with HUD. And they are the ones who administer the program and work directly with the landlords in their communities and work directly with the renters in their communities to ensure that the resources get out the door. Um, the second thing I'm going to point out there as well, too, is last time the federal government was kind of nearing that question mark about a shutdown, there was a lot of conversation about this. And one of the things that was really, I think, important in those discussions was just the level of attention that was paid to ensuring that the PHAs and the HRAs had the resources they needed to continue to fulfill the obligations of the federal government to landlords. Um, and finally, just wanting to reiterate um, that this does not restrict the amount of rent that landlords can charge. It does not restrict their ability to use their own screening criteria based on things like people's ability to pay the balance of the rent, people's credit scores, people's criminal background, people's history as renters. Instead, all this does is say that you cannot say no to someone just because a government entity is paying their rent. Um, and this is a really great program for landlords as well too, because they're gonna get that rent paid. Because the housing is affordable to the people who live there, 
that individual renter is gonna be paying 30% of their income towards their housing costs, and the balance is gonna be paid through the vouchers. So it makes programs, it makes housing stability um, a real priority. And this is true both for the renters living in that housing as well as the landlords. Did you have a, a follow-up, Representative Johnson, or? Uh, Chair Howard, it's interesting that uh, we have uh, differences of, of opinion how things work. We, we, we already know that uh, it's actually in the, at least I was informed it was in the contract that with the federal government that they can reduce the, reduce the payment if funds are short. And that, that can hurt the property owner and the house, who's the housing provider. And rent has gone up quite a bit because of the regulations that this body has put on them that caused them to go up. Uh, different regulations that sound good at this time or that time. Uh, we've had a number that uh, it sounds like a good idea till we find out what the cost is on it and how much it costs the tenants because the property owners have to put in millions of dollars because of the regulations we put on. So I want to be careful, make sure that uh, if we do anything, we do it right and do things that'll actually keep the co uh, keep housing affordable instead of keep driving up the cost and keep e people out. If we keep driving up the cost, it'd only be for one reason. And that would be the government taking over all housing. And that's what I'm afraid that uh, some of these bills are gonna push to. So with that, I'm gonna ask my member members not to support this bill because I think it uh, it's going down the <laughs> wrong way uh, Ms. Kaplan uh, made the statement that Minnesota was the outlier in this because there's 17 states. There's actually 50 states in the United States. 17 is the outlier, not the 33 that don't have this. Uh, it's only one third is not, one third would be the outlier, not the two thirds that uh, don't have it. I do have two members on the list and then we'll move to a vote. Uh, Representative Kozlowski. Thank you, Chair Howard, uh, Representative Herr, and to our testifier. Um, I wanted to just thank you for bringing forward uh, this bill. As we know, um, tenants' rights haven't um, been moved in many years, and as well as for your last points about explaining uh, the process between the federal funding and, and our local HRAs as well. I just wanted to chime in and say that uh, from Greater Minnesota, this is uh, something I am really excited about um, and can speak to, um, you know, was just in conversation with our local HRA explaining that in, in Greater Minnesota where I'm at in Northeastern, there are a mismatch between the vouchers which people are waiting months and years for with the available apartments that will take them in. Something that, um, you know, there are many tenant landlord resources and our local HRA has been doing a lot of work in reaching out um, because our city actually was part of the designation with the federal dollars that received increase. So to the point of this would add cost. Um, it would actually, uh, as you mentioned, Representative Her, cover the increase in rent. Um, and so it is a win-win for both tenants and landlords. But I wanted to know if maybe for our testifier, if you could speak to um, some of the strategies that if passed might uh, similarly be used across the state to work with landlords to better understand um, actually the benefits uh, and uh, overcome some concerns, as well as for renters who we know that when they're out there searching for uh, voucher friendly um, homes, how will they know that this, this now exists and that they can't be discriminated and turned away on the basis that they're receiving public assistance? So thank Representative you. Representative uh, I will, uh, Chair, I will go ahead and uh, turn it up to my testifier. Ms. Kaplan. Oh, uh, uh, thank you so much. Um, yeah, there are a couple of things that um, local jurisdictions have done uh, to make it easier for landlords to understand the voucher program and to utilize it. Um, and, and I think you know, one of the things that's really good is that everybody has an interest in making sure that the program works well. Um, enforcement of this would be under the, um, the Minnesota Human Rights Act, so the Department of Human Rights would be available as a resource. 
uh, to be able to provide information and answer questions for folks who are concerned or curious about how the how the mechanisms work. Um, but the other thing too is, you know, we've been working very closely along with other advocates with uh, Minnesota NARO, which is the association of HRAs in the state of Minnesota, and talking to the PHAs as well, just so that they can be prepared to understand how this works, what this looks like. Um, one of the things I would also say is a lot of the HRAs and PHAs, they want to be working closely with landlords. They want to be making sure things are simple, that they're streamlined, that they're understandable. Um, but this is also going to require a lot of education of renters as well, too. This is a pretty significant change uh, where people suddenly uh, will be able to use uh, their voucher in the community of their choice. And I think it's interesting, thinking about northeastern Minnesota, I believe the shopping success rate for vouchers there is right around 40%. That means 60% of people who receive vouchers just can't find a place to, to use it. Um, and I was looking at some of the data from Housing Link that kind of collects data about housing availability. And I think a really good example right now is in Scott County, for example, I was looking for apartments. There are 22 available, two of them accept vouchers. So this really expands the ability for people to choose where they live, to find the place where they live, uh, and really to make a set of choices about the community that they want to be a part of. And Representative Dotseth. Thank you, Chair Howard and uh, Representative Heard. Uh, question just for clarification, if a property owner chooses not to participate in Section 8 housing uh, vouchers, is there any exclusions that can be applied uh, in this process? Representative Heard. Uh, Chair Howard and uh, Representative, um, I I'm not quite sure how to answer that question because you don't either choose to discriminate or you, or you don't choose to discriminate. It's just that you can't just use that as the criteria to decide if somebody uh, can can rent from you and so I guess I'm not quite sure the question since if we just say you can't discriminate right now we do have people put ads out that this says will not accept section 8 housing or, or public assistance and so it'll just say now that you can't do that so if you look at the person again like I stated before the person's criteria you look at all of the what you would do as a normal landlord to look at if somebody is going to be a good renter you can make the decisions based on that but you can't just deny somebody because of their source of income this bill is actually really simple and it's actually not that complicated and so I just want to make sure people understand that that's all it's actually doing is not saying you opt in or out or just saying don't discriminate. Representative Just for clarification then, do all properties qualify for Section 8 housing currently right now or are there certain criteria that they have to abide by as well? I can have my Represent testify for answer. Oh, okay. Sorry, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Representative, for that question. I can have my testify answer, but from what I understand now is that it's actually a pretty simple process to see if your house qualifies. So let's say you go through the normal screening process and you find that somebody is a really good candidate, but their source of income is a voucher, then you can actually go through, there's two steps of you that you go through in order to have your property certified and then also to have it, you know, inspected and then you uh, sign a specific agreement with, uh, you know, through all the, with all the parties and entities. And then you because so any property that meets a requirement could be section 8 if that's if there's any clarification you want to make in there um, uh, thank you uh, <laughs> mr. chair representative um, the only thing I would add to that is you know there is a step where they do an inspection of the property um, they're looking at very basic health and safety things that are consistent with the covenants of habitability that everybody's already obligated to meet in the state of Minnesota um, and the, that's housing quality standards um, the other thing and this isn't about buildings qualifying for it but really about kind of like landlords if they own certain types of property and the rent is really high there then it's probably going to be above the housing uh, the voucher payment standard so the reality is those properties won't accept the vouchers, and they wouldn't have to uh, because, quite honestly, the amount that the voucher would pay plus the amount that the renter would pay just wouldn't be enough to meet whatever those higher rents are. Um, that exists today, and that would exist in the future as well, too, um, which does in some ways sort of limit a, a bit where the vouchers are going to be, going to be utilized. Is that satisfactory, Dotsa? No, I'm good. Thank you, Chair Howard. And I think Representative Johnson had one more quick question. Uh, just a couple quick first question. Well, actually, before I get to the question, it's going to make a, a, a clarification. Okay. Uh, where I was hearing that there's Section 8 housing available is in uh, Minneapolis. In greater Minnesota, the best part of the state, we have a huge housing shortage. We have no workforce housing. 
uh, what little rental units we have are filled with Section 8 housing already. The problem we have is uh, when there's grant money, which comes from the state, usually the local developers and local builders are cut out of the process for the building of them because of prevailing wage. And it's large corporations that come in, bring uh, workers from outside the community to build a project at an overinflated price for the market in that area so they can't build it because the rent that the housing provider would provide is too high for the community that it's in. So we don't have any buildings being built. So that, that's an issue that we got to deal with. Um, and the other question I have, Representative, her, uh, you talk, this is going, putting this in the ju jurisdiction of uh, uh, the Department of Human Rights, on which there will, I'm sure there will be some cost. Have you uh, requested or do you have a fiscal note for this bill yet? Representative Herb. Uh, Chair Howard and Representative Johnson, actually this bill has been through committee for four years. There's never been a fiscal note to this bill actually. And I don't know if we, we could try to request another one, but there's never been a fiscal note associated with this bill. Uh, Representative, I think there has been some cost carried in the, uh, the budget for the Department of Human Rights. I don't have the figure in front of me. I know it's not a huge dollar amount is my recollection. But it, Representative Johnson. It, uh, the, the fiscal note from, uh, I believe, from last year, oh, or last biennium, which should be higher now, so I'm guessing it's going to be around a, a million dollars and probably three employ full-time employees. And then, Representative Hur, I'll go to you for any closing comments on the bill. Sure, thank you, Chair Howard. And, and Representative, I will absolutely look into that. I don't remember a cost being that high, but I will absolutely look into it and get the information back to the committee. And I, so just in, in closing, I would ask our members to support this bill. You know, I do just want to touch on the fact that rent has gone up quite a bit, but it's not because of the legislation that we put through in this body. Actually, the research that I did uh, talked about how it's actually the one-sided market that's driven by homes that are being sold and the increase in those prices that has actually driven up the, the rental market prices. So it's not because of the legislation that we passed here. Um, and so I just want to be, be clear about that. And I do just want to also state that I did pull an article from Owatonna.com that talked about a summit that really looked at how can rural Minnesota actually do a better job in actually accepting Section 8. And one of the local landlords actually said, who's also a real estate agent, said that he has experience with Section 8 housing and he referred to these housing voucher programs and said that his experience has been very good uh, over the years. And so they're trying to figure out how to encourage more people to accept this. So clearly an article that was written from uh, from rural Minnesota states that we have an issue of people accepting vouchers that we need to do a better job of that as well. So in that, uh, knowing that this could be a good solution for all of that, our landlords and our tenants all benefit from this, I ask for this committee's support. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Representative Herr. With that, I renew my motion that House File 445 be re-referred to the House Judiciary Finance and Civil Law Committee. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. No. Nay. The motion carries. Thank you, Representative Herr. And you can stay right up there. All right, thank you, Chair. And, and present House File 315. <laughs> thank you, Chair. So House File 315 deals with two issues, prohibiting certain fees by landlords and places restrictions on landlords' entry. Um, an increasing number of landlords charge non-refundable fees for non-optional services rather than including the cost in the advertised rent. Um, some leases include bizarre fees like move-in fees. I saw one that just charged a January fee for no reason, but that it's January. So, um, you know, th those types of fees actually should just be built into uh, the cost of the rent. Um, and so, and the other piece of this is regarding privacy, that the current statute uh, uses the subjective term of reasonable notice for a landlord's notice for coming into someone's uh, home. And so the subjectivity leads to a violation sometimes of renters' privacy. And so this bill actually just addresses those two things. And Chair Howard, I do have a testifier here to talk to this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, Ms. Sterling, back to the committee. Thank you very much. Um, we do have a handout packet of some lease examples for the committee. I honestly don't know how this works. The page from the kitchen. <laughs> So uh, good afternoon, Chair Howard, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Rachel Sterling. I am a housing attorney with Homeline, a nonprofit statewide tenant or advocacy organization. Uh, Homeline's primary program is a hotline that any renter in Minnesota can contact. 
Um, and so we work directly with tenants and have a unique insight into issues facing many Minnesotan tenants. Uh, we urge this committee to move forward in support of House Files uh, 315, 316, 317, and 445. So specifically on House File 315, um, it addresses two issues, as Representative Kerr said, uh, based on lease fairness and business transparency. So <coughs> non-optional fees and tenants' rights to privacy. First, with regards to fees, an increasing number of landlords we see impose non-optional fees for non-optional services. So this is different from like a pet fee or a parking fee that a tenant can elect to add to their monthly costs. These fees include things like move-in or move-out fees, vague administrative fees, lease processing fees, amenity fees, fees to access a rental portal, portal so they can pay rent. The list goes on. Um, the uh, examples, we have fees in the packets that are being handed out. These are all actual <laughs> leases that have highlighted actual fees that are being charged that are not considered part of the rent. So included in the lease language, uh, these fees are rarely transparently included in the advertised rent. So that means that landlords are able to draw in potential tenants with a deceptively advertised rent amount and then effectively raise the rental cost of a given property by means of these non-optional fees. So because these fees are only revealed once a tenant has the lease in hand, uh, many tenants just aren't aware of the additional fees until late in the application process, often after they've paid an application fee and invested significant time, money, and hope in the rental unit. So House File 315 would prohibit those non-optional fees for non-optional services. So that means that in practice, all of those non-optional fees that are associated with renting a given property are just incorporated into the total rent. So it's not a, uh, any administrative rent service or other costs are just transparently presented to tenants as, cost, as the cost to rent the property, allowing tenants to understand how much they will need to actually pay each month before entering into a lease or for applying for an apartment that they can't actually afford. Ultimately, it does not prevent landlords from charging what they need to do in order to cover the cost of running their business. The bill solely requires that the true cost of a given property is communicated from the outset and that tenants do not need to worry about hidden fees when establishing their rental budget. Next, uh, with regard to the tenant's right to privacy, House File 315 would clarify the requirements of a landlord has to meet in order to enter a tenant's home without permission. So there's no debate that there are instances when a landlord has to enter a rental unit, whether it's to make repairs, conduct inspections, or offer showings to new prospective tenants. However, the reality is that when residential tenants rent properties, the tenants become a party who has a legal possession of that property, and more importantly, the property becomes their home. So a person should be able to expect privacy in their home. So as Representative Hurst said, under current Minnesota law, a landlord need only give reasonable notice currently before entering a rental property for a reasonable business purpose. Um, many tenants, therefore, just are uncertain about what type of privacy rights they have and find that they don't have the level of privacy in their homes that they deserve. The manifestation of these privacy issues vary, but it's expected when given the vague wording of the current law. I've worked with tenants whose landlords enter the property without, with, after giving only an hour's notice without waiting to confirm uh, that the tenant knows that they're coming so this has led to tenants being in the bathroom or the shower when the landlord comes in and um, other landlords give wide windows of when the tenant should expect them to enter meaning that the tenant has to alter their own plans for the day to accommodate the landlord's schedule or some landlords simply send out a notice stating that they'll be entering sometime in the next week and um, frankly this borderlines on meaningless warning so Tenants who suffer these privacy violations also, frankly, have very little recourse. Uh, the current law allows only, it's a $100 penalty per violation. After paying the filing fees and accounting for time and effort, this negligible penalty is hardly meaningful and tenants therefore almost never pursue it. So House File 315 uh, would define reasonable notice of as at least 24 hours prior to entering without permission. Then, then the proposed law would also require a landlord to give a four-hour window of when they plan to enter and with this window only being between the hours of 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. Finally, uh, if the right to privacy is violated, the tenants could pursue a meaningful civil penalty of the equivalent of one month's rent and reasonable attorney's fees. So 
while this law will not limit landlords' abilities to charge what they need to, nor to enter a tenant's home when needed, House Bill 315 will ensure that these practices are transparent and therefore more fair to tenants. So we encourage you to support House Bill 315. Thank you, Chair Howard and members of the committee. Thank you. The next testifier is Sia Sakandare. Sakarande, excuse me, an undergraduate student government representative. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Chair Howard and committee members. My name is Sia Sakardande. I use pronouns like she, her, and hers, and I'm the state coordinator for the undergraduate student government at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. Our organization serves over 30,000 undergraduates who make up our student body. We work to make many first-time renters on campus aware of predatory practices, such as imposing fees that renters often don't know they're being charged for, or entry by the landlord into the unit without any notice to the renter. I'm here in today of support of House File 315 because of the financial and pri privacy protections it would provide to thousands of student tenants. While many students already face financial stress from the high cost of tuition, the cost of groceries, and their ability to support themselves, the fees that students have tacked onto their already expensive leases range from $5 to $700. Technology fees, amenities fees, cleaning fees, sublet fees, and a move out fees fee are some, are some of the examples of the many that landlords take from our tenants. Students should not be forced to pay for amenities that they may not even have access to or for services that they could just perform themselves. For students who work hard to support themselves, school should come first not another payment for something that they do not have the option to opt out of. In terms of privacy, not only have I heard stor various stories from my peers about maintenance staff entering their rooms while they're in the shower or while they're taking an exam, but I have experienced violations of privacy myself. As a young woman with three other female roommates, hearing a loud knock at, on the door at 11 p.m. from our maintenance worker was a frightening experience. After seeing him try to enter our apartment because he was trying to look at our sink and dishwasher, we expressed our concerns to our management about setting boundaries for them entering our unit. We set clear expectations of when they could enter and asked for a notification if none of us were in the apartment, which our building manager agreed to. For the three maintenance requests we have filed since then, these expectations have not been met. We do not receive a reasonable notice of when they will be entering our apartment, which is something that many of my friends have experienced with various landlords. Being taken advantage of because of our inexperience as renters is something that we as students have become accustomed to. While we do understand that becoming a renter is a financial responsibility when we sign the lease, we did not sign up to be taken financially advantage of and not to have our boundaries respected. By strengthening our current legislation regarding these issues, your committee would be providing more support to student tenants, not only on our campus, but throughout the whole state, which is why the undergraduate student government of the University of Minnesota Twin Cities is in support of it. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next. We have Jennifer Spadini, Guardian Property Management. Ms. Spadini, welcome to the committee. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair and committee members, my name is Jennifer Spadini. I am board chair for the Minnesota Multi Housing Association, as well as owner operator at Guardian Property Management. Uh, overall, we do share concerns of hidden fees, but I appreciate the opportunity to highlight some concerns we have with HF 315. First, prohibiting all fees can provide some everyday operational issues. We would suggest an early fee disclosure to remedy the situation. As an example, operators regularly use ratio utility billing system, referred to as RUBS, to charge residents for utilities. The language in the proposal is unclear on whether these could be charged as the, these utilities are um, accessed and could be considered a fee for non-operational service. The next section of the bill outlines the 24-hour notice for which there are concerns about how this could function for property managers and how it would introduce inefficiencies and delays to the resident. There would be several challenges to reasonable management practices under this proposal. As an example, to illustrate our point, an appliance delivery company is bringing a new appliance to a resident. They reschedule the delivery window, which happens often, on the morning of delivery. Under the bill, we would have to postpone the delivery and provide another 
24 hour notice to comply under the timeline of the delivery company. This situation does not serve the best interests of our residents. Another concern remains the language in HF 315 does not provide a safe harbor for the ma manager to access the facility. When the resident agrees to access without a 24 hour notice, this situation is specifically created with the removal of the word substantially from the statute. We find this troubling, be troubling because it provides no flexibility for real world implementation. Using our example of receiving a new appliance, the property management entity could be penalized if they enter the apartment early, even with the resident permission. Based on the current language, we believe they can decide otherwise after the fact. A violation as defined in the proposal is any entry prior to the 24 hour duration that is not already exempted in 504B.211 subdivision four. The penalty outlined in the legislation provides for one month's rent. This does not seem to be consistent with the damages to the resident. It also states a violation of the 24 hour rule violates covenants of habitability which itself comes with significant additional penalties. We feel this is overly broad and is not consistent with damages occurred. Overall, we do share concerns about uh, hidden fees. However, we suggest a different solution. The second part of the proposal simply does not account for how a rental business operates and penalizes managers in a way which is disproportionate. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. Thank you for your testimony. Is there anyone else from the public that would like to testify? If not, we can go to member questions and I saw Representative Nash on the list. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and to the author. Um, if I am reading this correctly, there are no administrative fees that you find are worthy of collection. Is that right? Representative Herb. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Nash, uh, I, I don't think I stated that. But Representative Nash. Mr. Chair, I, I believe that your testifier did. Um, and uh, I mean, it says, except for actual services rendered for an optional service uh, offered by the landlord in line 1.8, 1.9, 1.10 carries it out. Um, your testifier has talked about the absurdity of cleaning fees and subletting fees and other fees. Um, <coughs> but your testifier did say that. So I'm just pointing that out. And I'm sure Mr. Chair heard that as well. Um, a subletting fee, obviously, you, the, the landlord has to be able to track who's in, in the unit, right? So if there's a fee that's associated with that, because it does take their time, that does not strike me as something that's unreasonable. Uh, similarly, a cleaning fee, if, if the tenant just leaves a mess behind and they, that, that seems like a reasonable expectation. So I'm, I'm merely going off of what your testifiers offered, Representative Herr. Um, I, I'm, I'm a little surprised by that, that now all these fees are going to be waived. Um, I, I find that rather troubling. Re Representative Ferdinand, do you have a comment? I, I do, Chair, and, and thank you, uh, Representative Nash. Um, I, I think maybe we might have heard different things because I guess, um, you know, service is rendered. So I guess I don't understand why um, a landlord would charge a January fee just because it became January. That's not services rendered. And so, um, you know, I think that there has, there's no uh, opposition to landlords having to charge the fees in which gets their unit ready for the next renter or, um, you know, fixes damages. I mean, those are uh, services rendered. And so I just want to, I'll turn it over to my testifier to provide clear, uh, clarification on uh, what he's, uh, what Representative Nash is stating her statements were, but we're just saying unnecessary fees that actually don't cover a service. Unless January became something we started charging people for, I guess that's kind of what I'm looking at. Ms. Sterling. So to, for clarification as well, it's for non-optional fees for non-optional services. So administrative fees are absolutely a part of doing business, mm -hmm. but it sh if that is a known fee, that is a monthly cost, it can be part of the rent. Um, also for things like cleaning or damages that may have been beyond normal wear and tear, those are already covered under uh, Minnesota 504B.178 security deposits. Um, and so that is what a security deposit is um, for in those sort of circumstances. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I, 
I wrote down exactly what was recited during testimony. So uh, if we could move on then to line 2.11, your damages. Um, so let's, let's say that the rent is, I don't know, pick a number, $1,800 a month, uh, that you're moving uh, from a $100 civil pen penalty to the loss of, of a month's worth of rent of $1,800 for the abrogation of any of these things that you have in your in your bill. Um, that just seems like a trial lawyer's dream and maybe that's maybe this is a trial lawyer's bill, but it, it seems like that's just very aggressive. Um, no offense to the lawyers in our crowd, um, but well, maybe a little. Um, but but it just seems that I mean, that's that again, another very heavy handed approach to trying to, to, to come up with a solution for something that I think reasonable people would come up with reasonable uh, offers and reasonable expectations. I mean, let's take this to an extreme. If you have somebody who has a, a $5,000 a month rent for uh, a very nice apartment, that this is now going to say that you can be penalized an entire month's rent for doing something that uh, is not within the bounds of, of this. Uh, once again, that, that's, not, that's not how I view um, as a business owner, I'm a recovering business owner, I would never interact with my clients in that manner. And it just seems unbelievably heavy, heavy handed because you, you went from a specific amount as a, as a penalty to an open ended amount that has really no cap on it. And that seems punitive uh, instead of trying to collect something that uh, is a, a minor penalty to probably pursue a corrective ac action with a landlord. Um, I, I just think that this is really potentially damaging for housing providers. And I, I guess, um, you know, the, the trial lawyers are going to reach out and say thanks because that's what this is going to open up. Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and to represent her, you know, I, I've been a renter at, at times as well, and I know that for all of us that, that do rent uh, we want to have the security of the, our own space and have the control over that and, and want to have some uh, semblance of control over that personal space. And, and yet I've also been a homeowner and have tried to figure out repairs and other things. And the concern that I have is in regards to, to the notice and specifically um, the withdrawal of permission. Because uh, I, I know that like during air conditioning season, especially first part of the season, Trying to get somebody to come and repair an air conditioner during the heat of time could be devastatingly long. Uh, I mean, taking much more longer than than a four-hour window. That's opportunity there, and and I don't know if you're aware that line 2.1 to 2.2, and I don't know if you were intended this, but it says a tenant may withdraw their permission at any time. That would imply, at least it would infer that uh, landlord knocks say they decided even to use a four hour window and said we're going to be there between eight and 12 and they knock on your door at nine o'clock uh the tenant says i'm sorry i don't want you in today well they've already arranged for the repairman or whatever to come in and if it's not their own pers personnel uh, that means they have to hire another um res or another uh, repairman uh, with fees and origination fees and so forth I'm not sure if you intended it that way or not, but that seems overly restrictive uh, with giving a permission to withdraw at any time. And I'm wondering if that was was what you thought about when you did this bill or if that was just an oversight. Representative Herr. Uh, thank you, Chair. And I will let my testifier respond to that piece of it. I did see it in there and it was a change from the last year's language, so. Mr. Erling. Thank you, uh, Chairman and Representative Petersburg. So um, there is uh, language as well that, so what this is saying is that the landlord, uh, if the landlord gives the appropriate permission as outlined in the statute, um, then they don't need the tenant's permission to enter at that time. I believe that's line 1.19. <coughs> Representative Petersburg, follow up. Uh, but that's, that's not what the language says, 2.1 to 2.2. Uh, it says a tenant may withdraw their permission at any time. It doesn't give a preclusion that it's after the agreement. It says at any time up to whatever it might be. That's if it's less than the 24-hour notice. 
Representative Petersburg, any, any other follow-up? And, and maybe this is something that can, can be. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah I, I don't, you know, I'm just saying that's not what the language says. I mean, that may be what you intended, but that's not what it says. So just for clarification. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Dodseth. Thank you, Representative uh, Howard, Chair Howard, and uh, Representative Hurd. The uh, question I um, have is I actually heard our testifier make mention of uh, emergency with the dishwasher where it was actually uh, repairman show up. The question I would have, are there any safeguards in here for the landlord uh, or the property owner in the event that there is an issue, say a, a dishwasher is leaking, your third floor uh, unit and it's leaking and we all know that water can create a lot of damage. Are there any precautionaries where the landlord can then get in and actually uh, resolve those issues and take care of that in an emergency? Representative Furr. Chair Howard and Representative, uh, thank you for that question. Actually, in line 2.12, uh, the section uh, 504B.38, that does refer to the emergency tenant remedies. And so uh, if a landlord needs to get access uh, because of an emergency, they can still have access. And I, I also just want to remind the committee that there's nothing that um, says that a landlord and a tenant can't talk about what needs to happen. So if you say to your tenant, hey, somebody's going to be coming to deliver your refrigerator tomorrow, they told me between you know 8 and noon, and it doesn't happen, Having conversations with your tenant to continue to work out when you can't control circumstances is always still an option. This doesn't change anything around that. So emergencies are not changed by this particular rule and also continued conversations between tenant and landlords do not change. Representative Dotsa. Thank you. I see Representative Petersburg may, may have one follow up. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think what you just said was something Show me in here where it gives that kind of discretion because this is very specific and the penalties are very descript. Uh, I, I don't know of any place where it says um, you can make prearranged agreements. This is very black and white. So I, I would question your, just, your comment you just had. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Furr. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you for the question. So it actually is very, you're right, it is very specific about giving 24-hour notice. And so it doesn't say that you can't have conversations with your tenant to work out agreements. It's, so I, I just want to be clear about that. It doesn't actually prevent you from doing that. Representative Furr, any final comments on the bill? Oh. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to uh, thank you, Chair. And um, I just wanted to maybe address Representative Nash's comment about how this is a trial lawyer's dream. And maybe it is, maybe it's not, I'm not a trial lawyer. But what I can say is that what this does is the fee actually makes it equal between tenants and landlords. Right now, a landlord gets to keep your one month's deposit for security. So now this just says that if the landlord violates your rights, then you get one month. Uh, uh, so I just think that it's, it's equity, it's parity. And so with that, I do ask that this is a very reasonable bill, and I ask for this committee support of the bill. And sorry, Mr. Perry, I just I saw that Minority Lee Johnson did have a, hopefully a quick question or a quick comment. A uh, quick, uh, couple quick comments. One, the way the bill is written, I don't know of any housing provider that it didn't have it in writing if they were going to violate uh, the four-hour rule because the delivery person was late and um, would it even do it because it's written so the way it's written <clears throat> the tenant even though agreed to it in, uh, verbally they could turn around and go to court and, t and they would win by the way this is written. Mm -hmm. Secondly, I'm looking at this uh, uh, information that was passed out. Every lease agreement I've seen had all this stuff in it. It was there when you get the application. I think it's an issue of some people not reading it when they fill it out, but generally that information is there, and it should be. Um, so that's uh, a concern I have. And then uh, one last comment on the damage deposit. It's a deposit. Guess what? When you move out, you get it back. Or it's, and I know people <coughs> on it, they've talked to the, land, the ma property management or the housing provider, and they, use, they ask to use the last month's or the damage deposit as the last month's rent so they can use the, that month's rent for the down, for the whatever they need for the, wherever they're moving to. And it's usually an agreement that it'd be no damage done. They'd inspect it ahead of time and make sure it was fine. They'd take pictures ahead of time before they actually moved out. And many 
housing providers have done that. Unfortunately, there's a few people that uh, took advantage of that, so it's done less, but it's still done. But the damage deposit is returned to the individual. So saying that it's, it's, been, it's not is a misnomer, and, but to give a person going from a $100 fine or penalty to up a couple thousand dollar penalty, and at one of your bills in here, it's like three months, I think, that you have coming up. But uh, with what you have in this bill, compared to the next one we're going to hear, they don't coincide. They, they, met, they don't mesh together. They're in conflict with each other. So if both pass, it's going to be a big issue as well. A any quick final comment, Rep. Okay. Uh Yeah, so just like if uh, you don't wreck your apartment, you get your deposit back, just like landlords don't violate your privacy, you don't get taken to court and pay a month's worth of rent. So I think that's pretty equal and I ask for the committee's support of the bill. With that, members, I renew my motion that House File 315 be re-referred to the House Judiciary Finance and Civil Law Committee. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. Motion carries. Next we have House File 316, Representative Herr. House file 316, maybe we'll have different conversations <laughs> around this one. Uh, thank you, Chair Howard. So House file 316 deals with three issues pertaining, uh, and three issues, and um, it's one, uh, mentors, uh, heating uh, for someone's unit should be at 68 degrees between October 1st and April 30th. Um, this, and this uh, bill proposes a statewide heat code for that. Um, the second part is that this language also seeks to have more, biz, uh, more housing issues considered emergency repairs needs and includes um, uh, items listed on page three, lines 3.2 to page four, line 4.1, such as loss of running water, loss of hot water, loss of heat, um, you know, loss of electricity, those types of um, uh, critical uh, services within a unit. And finally, it currently costs tenants roughly $300 to file a court case concerning emergency repairs. And that simply is just too cost burden to place on households living paycheck to paycheck. And this bill authorizes the court to charge a filing fee equal to that for conciliation or small claims court of $70. Um, and Chair Howard, I will just go ahead and then turn this over to my testifier, Rachel, to, uh, to testify on that. Thank you, Ms. Sterling. Thank you, Chair Howard, uh, representatives. Uh, House File 316 is an umbrella bill covering heat and emergency repairs. So it is no secret that Minnesota is cold. Uh, Sub-zero temperatures are not considered unusual, uh, with wind chill temperatures often sinking much lower. And cold indoor temperatures are especially dangerous for the elderly, young children, and people with health problems. And the risk of fire also increases in the winter because many Minnesotan tenants are forced to rely on alternative heating sources during the winter months, such as space heaters and ovens. Under the current law, there's no statewide requirement that landlords maintain a rental unit at any specific temperature. Some cities have ordinances requiring a certain temperature be maintained, and many other cities simply require that a building's heating system is capable of maintaining a temperature of 60 degrees, but don't actually require that the landlord keep the building that warm. Still others have just no heating or building code protections for heat whatsoever. So instead of having a patchwork of different rules, which can vary substantially from city to city in both terms of content and enforceability, House File 316 creates a statewide requirement guaranteeing that a tenant has a right to a minimum temperature during the cold weather months. Uniformity across the state that experiences severe weather will be an important protection for tenants. So then the second important part of House File 316 is its provision about emergency repairs. So, under the current law, most repair issues are brought by tenants through what's called a rent escrow action. Um, and this process is lengthy. It usually takes a minimum of 28 days before repair issues are heard in a court if it gets that far, and often even longer before the repairs are actually completed. So for emergency situations, uh, these can be expedited cases called emergency tenant remedies actions, or ETRAs. Um, and that requires that a tenant give the landlord a 24-hour notice uh, of the issue before they can pursue the relief from the court. So currently, uh, the scopes of those issues are as Representative Per said, but the proposed law would expand the list of issues that could be considered emergencies. So by delineating what issues are permissible in an ETRA action, this law would more clearly give instruction to tenants, landlords, and courts. Specifically, the proposed law also includes the loss of a working refrigerator, serious infestation, and the loss of air conditioning or elevator if that's what's promised in the lease. 
Um, so this bill uh, does account for landlord attempts to remedy emergency issues with external circumstances may prevent full remedy within those 24 hours, as long as the landlord is addressing the issues and adequately communicating about repair plans. An example would be if a supply chain issue prevents a landlord from accessing an essential part to repair an elevator, for example. So in addition to the narrow and ambiguous scope of um, qualifying ETRA issues, uh, the filing fee for an ETRA costs the tenant about $300. Right now, so in comparison, that rent escrow action is only about seventy to eighty dollars to file. So the higher amount seems grossly unfair, frankly, when one considers the fact that in ETRA cases are about emergencies, so loss of essential services and facilities that the landlord has promised to both provide and maintain. So similarly, tenants whose landlords commit illegal lockouts, which uh, is uh, when a landlord or an agent of the landlord unlawfully and in bad faith removes, excludes, or forcibly keeps a tenant from the residential premises of otherwise where the tenant should have a legal right to possession, um, those also cost $300 to file to get their day in court to remedy that situation. So this proposed law lowers the cost of the filing fee for the ETRA and lockout actions to mirror what the rent escrow actions cost, specifically setting the filing fee at the same rate as a conciliation court in order to lower the financial barrier faced by many tenants seeking to address an emergency issue. Adopting this law to clarify what constitutes adequate heat and or emergency repair will ultimately create uniformity and clarity for both landlords and tenants, as well as making it easier for tenants who are facing emergency situations to advocate for their rights. We urge you to support House File 316. Thank you, Chair Howard and members of the committee. Thank you. Up next, uh, we ask Jennifer Spadini uh, to come back. Welcome back. Thank you, Mr. Chair, committee members. My name is Jennifer Spadini. I'm here, uh, I'm board chair for the Minnesota Multi Housing Association. I come today to raise concerns for HF 316. Um, the minimum heating code does not recognize how multifamily buildings are built and heat their facilities. Commonly, older facilities use a boiler system, which creates constant heat, which flows through the building. A boiler system causes those in the center to be warmer, while those on the upper level corners generally remain cooler. During the coldest days in Minnesota, we receive emails and text messages from Minnesota energy providers asking us to reduce our consumption by turning down the heat several degrees, usually recommending temperatures lower than 68 degrees. It is worth some consideration of the author and committee to think about how to address those situations. The language is one size fits all that doesn't match the significantly different uh, climate and heating systems multifamily housing is located in. Local housing maintenance codes can be applied in circumstances to reflect the local heating requirements and have been done in most municipalities. Moving to the ETRA, the expansion of the ETRA is problematic for operation on a couple of examples. Um, AC appliances are problematic because it does not take into account the nature of our property management business practices, especially as it relates to appliances. For example, when replacing or repairing an air conditioning unit, this is entirely a seasonal activity. Our suppliers understandably have specific quantity and inventory available at the beginning of the season. If an air conditioner breaks at the end of the season and the part is no longer available, or the cost of repair is invested into a new unit, then we are faced with the challenge that the seasonal inventory is often sold out. How can we comply with the ETRA in that circumstance? We can financially compensate the residents, supply fans, among other options to mitigate the situation. My testimony today outlined a few of the concerns we have and why we have concerns. We do believe we can work with the author, the chair, and the committee members to address these issues. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank Member questions? I saw Representative Nash. Pretty much every bill, Mr. Chair. <laughs> um, uh, if Ms. Bedini would come back, I have maybe a question of, of her as well. Um, but I'll start off with one for Representative Her. Uh, if a housing provider wanted to be proactive and be on the ball for 
the maintenance maintenance of the 68 degrees, and they didn't want to have to uh, in inconvenience the tenant. So they want to now have a central monitoring system. You've heard that there's some older uh, systems. How are they going to do that? How do they know without hearing from the tenant that 68 wasn't hit? Because the penalties you've you've got in here for that, but how are they going to know? Um, that an, an upper outside is not 68 because suddenly now they're in violation of that. So maybe help me understand because it sounds like to me that it's going to be something that's a cost pushed out to the housing provider to create a system to maintain their or to keep their finger on the pulse of the heat in those, those buildings. Help me understand that because it sounds really quite expensive and quite far flung. Representative Herb. Thank you, Chair uh, Howard and uh, Representative. I always love your uh, adjectives that you use to describe the issues you're looking at here, uh, far flung. So uh, I, I do just want to address that. So I don't particularly know the system that you're referring to. So I'm assuming you're saying that if there's a four unit uh, building and then a landlord puts in a system where he's controlling those four units, but he's not having a thermostat in each unit so people can know what their apartment is at. I guess I'm not understanding your question. Representative Nash. Mr. Chair, thank you. Well. Not every thermostat reports back to a central location, and I'm just trying to uh, create a baseline that that's true, and you, you know that that is true. So a thermostat is a local unit that doesn't necessarily push data out unless it's a smart thermostat. Um, so a, a landlord may not know that it's not 68, but suddenly they're an abrogation of your new law. Um, this could create a need for there to be a centralized system that isn't free and will require that they make those investments so that they're not on the wrong side of, of your new law. Uh, does that make sense where I'm, where I'm headed with this? Representative Furr, and it looks like Ms. Sterling might have a, yeah. She does, and I'll now let her answer the question, but I, I would just say that I, I wanna remind us that this is not about people not doing their jobs, as landlords or tenants being difficult. That in the cases that we have seen, it's usually because a landlord persistently isn't keeping a unit at a certain. So it's, people are talking to each other. I guess we keep assuming these circumstances are where like the tenant never talks to the landlord and one day sues him because it's not a 68 and he doesn't know, right? I think that we have to remember, assume reasonableness with people because I'm also not assuming that landlords are unreasonable and purposely not keeping their units at 68, just like I would hope we don't assume that tenants are just unreasonable and they're just going to now uh, take their uh, landlord to court because they didn't know it was at 68. But I will let my uh, testifier address that. Question. Ms. Sterling. So thank you, uh, Representative Howard, <coughs> Chair Howard and Representative Nash. Um, so there's a uh, requirement. So tenant would have to uh, measure the temperature in the unit um, at least 36 inches away from a window and 36 inches up from the floor, so like on a coffee table or something that in the middle of a unit to show that it's not, in fact, the 68 degrees. And then they have to inform the landlord, give them that 24-hour notice that this is not um, at the required temperature. Representative Nash. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I, I do have questions regarding your inclusion, uh, Representative Her, in lines 3.9, 3.10 and then lines 4.16 through 4.18. Uh, we just heard a little bit ago that fees should be lumped into the cost of things instead of having them filed and, and issued separately. So I'm just a little confused as to uh, why you tried to get away or get rid of fees in the past and, uh, and now we have a reasonable fee that's, that's here. That's more commentary, but um, Ms. Spadini, your question to you uh, is now that you have been reseated is, the difficulty in maintaining 68, given uh, potentiality of what happened in Dallas a couple of years ago with the uh, brownout and blackout and loss of, of power, um, I don't see any allocation for a, uh, any catastrophes in here. Is that one of the reasons that you're opposed to this, is that it's very difficult to, to consistently maintain that when things that are outside of your control do take effect? Correct, things outside of our... Go ahead, Ms. Fadini. Oh. Sorry. That's all right. Things outside of our control, as well as um, the older buildings where the heat, um, it's boiler system, so that is uh, the water is heated and the heat flows through the building through piping and just being able to regulate it, which is nearly impossible. Representative Nash. And Mr. Chair, just briefly. Um, so rumor has it we get cold here. Um, mm. Representative Hassan, the story you had the other day about those people who had to live in a building without a, uh, windows, that was garbage, and I have other stronger words for that, but 
on the outside chance that we hit as we have in years past, let's say 30, 40 below, um, to me this seems like a very unreasonable requirement when particularly uh, some of our, our power providers like an XL Energy who routinely uh, says, hey, uh, you know, things are a little rough right now, we need to have you use less energy. You're, you're setting these people up for failure and it's going to happen. And the fees are once again well defined and I, I think that this is just a very anti-housing uh, provider. I know that they do their level best. I believe that they do their level best. They want to do that. But your bill doesn't really give them any room for uh, the hand of God as uh, in Latin it's due machina that doesn't provide any of that. And I'm a little troubled by that. Representative Johnson. Uh, <clears throat> Chair Howard, Representative Her, Representative Nash hit on a couple of points I was gonna talk about. But I'm looking at uh, 2.3 to 2.5. I guess most tables aren't 36 inches tall. They're either a lot taller or they're a lot shorter. Coffee tables aren't 36 inches. Kitchen tables are 42. Oh, so you're going to have to design a special table to put a thermometer on that's 36 inches away from the wall while the kid knocks it over. And who's going to be watching it? Are you going to have to buy a special one that re records the temperature uh, one week at a time and it's going to make arrangements to go in to get the paper to, to find out what the temperature is? It makes it very difficult to do that. We also have people that do not want the temperature that warm. I was talking to one of our staff this afternoon, this afternoon about this bill, and he keeps his thermometer at 62 because that's what he likes. But according to this, if he's renting, even though he wants it at 62 degrees, the landlord could be taken to court and fine. And we have the other issue where the boiler systems, and I've been in many apartment complexes serving papers. And the hallways in the wintertime are always 95 degrees. And the apartments are usually a lot warmer than that, except when you get into uh, by the outside walls. Corner apartments. They're always colder. I've had one in, uh, before. They are cooler. And if you have a centralized heating system, it can create a lot of problems. Or when I was uh, renting up in Hibbing while I was going to school, I had all my windows and doors closed and covers over the windows because I was, was the corner and it was cold. A friend of mine lived uh, two apartments down, and he actually had his windows open in the wintertime because it was so warm. And it's because of how the heating system was designed originally, and a lot of our apartment complexes are old, just because the cost of building them has gotten out of sight, and we can't, the return on investment on building new ones is not there. It costs more to build them than they can actually get in return. So this bill is going to put a do very large issue and burden on our housing providers to the point where they might just shut the facility down. I don't know if that's your intent with the bill. I'm not going to ask. But with some of these bills, it makes you wonder. We've had bills in the past that uh, do not allow people to buy property for rental, especially a single family homes, where they want to be a housing provider. We are in a dire need for housing providers. And bills like this and some of the other ones is making the problem worse. 
So I don't know how we're going to fix this. I don't know how we can get the temperature set in each apartment so it's at 68 degrees or no less. Unless we have some of them maybe at 90 degrees. Especially in with the boiler systems in one central heating unit. So I would represent her. I'd take a real close look on what you're pushing because you might be doing more damage than good. And so with that, I'm going to ask my members to vote against it. I did see Representative Myers had a, a question. Uh, yeah, I'll make it quick. Uh, Chair Howard, thank you. Uh, Representative Hurd, thank you. Um, you know, one thing I am excited is the opportunity that we have to work together to, you know, look at some new housing options. So hopefully um, the complications with 68 degrees isn't an issue. Um, the question I would have, and it's more educational for me, is do we have a rough idea in Minnesota uh, how many units there are that, you know, run on a boiler type system or could potentially be affected um, to help reach that goal? I think that would help me get in perspective. Representative Herr. Chair Howard and, and Representative, thank you for that question. Actually, um, that number is a little bit more difficult to get, but I can show you is that there is over 100 cities that already have this requirement uh, in statute. And um, I, this, I anticipation of this question, I actually talked to uh, the prior uh, di uh, director at DSI in St. Paul, which also has this ordinance, and he said in his 30 years of actually doing this work, there has never been one landlord who hasn't been able to meet this heat requirement. Um, that Anyone that has <coughs> difficulty usually finds a way to address that. And so I know that I'm hearing a lot of people saying, oh, landlords are going to go out of business and they can't do it. Well, St. Paul's been doing this for a long time, and we are one of the largest cities. And uh, in, like I said, in our director's 30 years, he's that never had a landlord not be able to meet this heat requirement. So I don't foresee this being a problem or people getting out of this business uh, because they are uh, not able to meet this requirement. So I don't have the <coughs> number yet, but what I do have is the data that shows it can be done and it has been done. And I would encourage all of you to go and pull this list so you can see all of the cities. And there are uh, small towns, there are big towns all over the state of Minnesota that already do this. Representative Myers, any follow-up? Representative Furr, final comments on the bill? Yes, uh, I would just ask that uh, the support of this, I want to be clear that the, the uh, area that um, Representative Johnson mentioned, 2.3 to 2.5, that's actually to help the landlord so that a tenant doesn't take their temperature against a, a wall that is up against an outdoor, you know, uh, against, um, like, just faces the outdoor so that it's reading lower than what the house is, uh, or what the unit is actually reading. And so actually, this helps the, the, the landlord, not really the tenant. I just want to be very clear. And I also want to be very clear, the issues that we have with housing and the housing shortage, again, has to do more with the environment in which we operate in right now. I want to be very clear that, it's, that the, re, the research tells me that rental properties in landlord-friendly states, um, it's not just because of uh, our state, if we're trying to have better restrictions, this doesn't mean that you're not going to be profitable here. Being, having property in a state that has a robust market, which ours does, actually is more profitable for a landlord. So I just want to be very clear. And if we want to address this, then I suggest that we all sit with our uh, with our um, builders and talk with them as to why, you know, around labor costs and material costs, all of those things that actually contribute more for the, to the cost of housing than actually these uh, tenant protection laws we're putting into place. So with that, I would ask for the committee's support of the bill. And with that, I think I forgot before, so I will make my motion that House File uh, 315 be referred to the House Judiciary Finance and Civil Law, or House, excuse me, House File 360. Um, be re-referred to the House Judiciary Finance and Civil Law Committee. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Nay. No. Motion carries. Representative Herr, we got through three out of four of your bills, um, and we only have a couple minutes left, so I think we'll, we'll have you back uh, in housing, which is, you know, just one more day with Representative Herr. Uh, we'll take that. Uh, so with that, members, uh, the committee is adjourned.